And I'm like, shit, I want those dreams. That's so much better than adult dreams. I mean, the King Bee has got some shit it can sell you if you want to see unicorns coming in through your windows. We can help you out with that. Remember when we first met John McClane? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down to Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but it was sweet when they killed Ellis. And with a little help from Welcome back to Shat the Movies, the podcast where we ask the question, were the movies we loved when we were growing up really that good? Have you caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you even know what Blockbuster Video is? If you answered yes, then this is the podcast for you. I'm your host, Gene Lyons, and alongside me are my two co-hosts, Big D, Dick Ebert. Good evening. And Ashley Radiateur Schlafly. You're born in the gutter, you end up in the port. And we're going to take a look back in time and decide if our favorite films still hold up. Each week, the audience selects from six movie choices, and we break out our race car VHS tape rewinder and watch the movie that tallied the highest number of votes. At the end of the podcast, the three of us will provide the audience with the number of wipes each movie would take to get off their respective bums. So find a comfortable spot on the sofa and accompany us for a journey through our vast VHS movie collections. If you'd like to download Shat the Movies, you can get it via iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Pandora, TuneIn, Spotify, or wherever fine podcasts are found. And this week, Ash and Big D, we are continuing our string of commissions. We are so grateful to the listeners for sending in their commissions, uh, adding a few dollars for Shat the Movies so we can continue to bring you other programming like Shat on TV, where we're currently doing Westworld. Again, these dollars help us keep the lights on, and we're uh, very appreciative for your help. This week, we have a very special commission uh, that uh, is a foreign <laughs> film that Big D seemed somewhat opposed to in the beginning. Uh, yeah, this is our first foreign film. And generally, the process of commissioning film is you go to shatthemovies.com forward slash support. And it says, before you make a donation, before you assume we'll cover a movie, write us and say, hey, is it okay to do this movie? And the general criteria is it shouldn't be something so obscure like Time Rider, which was my fault, <laughs> that almost nobody had seen or you couldn't get digitally. Uh, so we got a commission from one of our listeners, Lisa. And Lisa said she wanted to commission a foreign language film. And I looked it up and I said, you know, I said, we generally don't do it. Uh, I ran it by the rest of the team. And Gene immediately was like, yes, yes, I'm all about it. So... We said, you know what, even though this movie doesn't have a, a large built-in American audience, or at least I don't think Shat the Movies audience, we decided to go with Lisa because she talked us into it, and uh, it, it will diversify our movie portfolio, and we decided to cover the 1995 French film, The City of Lost Children. And as a point, Lisa, just so you know, you have allies on the Shat team, Ashley and I are big fans of City of Lost Children, and we're delighted mm-hmm. when we found out uh, that you commissioned it. Lisa wrote in, movies and TV shows have quite a way of infiltrating our thoughts and emotions. Have you ever had memory of a movie or show that you thought was a dream or a nightmare? What about a dream or a nightmare that you thought was an actual memory? My first dream that was a memory was about seeing H.R. Puffin stuff, and I thought I'd made the whole thing up on my own. I was well into adulthood before someone informed me that I must have seen H.R. Puffin stuff as a kid. And it's actually a relief to know that Witchy Poo and a speaking flute were not products of my brain. On the other hand, my first memory I thought was a dream was of my sister being kidnapped by our babysitter when we were young kids. My sister was four years older than me, and I kept seeing her dragged away from me in my dreams for years. But by the time I was old enough to be told the truth by my parents, I had already convinced myself it was nothing but a nightmare. The city of lost children hits a little close to home. Children are abducted, and they're abducted for their dreams. I saw it as a teenager originally, and though I'm now on the downhill to 40, it will always remind me of parts of my childhood I wish I'd forget. And that comes from Lisa. Well, Lisa, welcome to the downslope to 40. That quickly becomes the downslope to 50. So welcome aboard. I don't consider it a downhill to 40. I'll be 40 in May and I'm excited about it. Like, here's the thing is when, when I hit my twenties, I could do whatever the hell I wanted. When you hit your thirties, you can say you're too old for whatever you don't want to do. Right? Like somebody's like, Hey, you want to code my pinball night? No. You want to play cards against humanity on zoom? I don't No, I'm too old for that. 
And then when you get to 40, you can just start dressing like shit. It's, it's like, it's a progressive release of all the things you thought you had to do. Yeah. You could not pay me to go back to my twenties or even my early thirties. I'm 36. So I guess I'm on that, that down slope or what I consider to be an upward slope with you there, uh, Lisa, but I, I definitely don't consider it a bad thing. I think that getting older I, has never bothered me. And I think that the further away I get from my childhood, the happier I think I probably wind up being. Well, The City of Lost Children is a 1995 science fantasy film directed by Marc Caro and Jean-Pierre Jeunet and starring Ron Perlman, an international co-production of companies from France, Germany, and Spain. The film is stylistically related to the previous and subsequent Jeunet films, Delicatessen and Amelie. The musical score was composed by Angelo Badalamenti with costumes designed by Jean-Paul Gaultier, and it holds a 79% approval rating from Rotten Tomatoes. Roger Ebert, whoever that is, gave the film three stars out of a possible four, writing that the film's design and visual effects deserved the highest possible praise, but the story was sometimes confusing. Ebert said, I'd be lying if I said I understood the plot. So speaking of understanding this movie, I think we were all fairly young when we saw this. Big D, you were the (laughs) oldest when you saw it. Uh, What did you think? Yeah, so I was uh, 46 when I saw this couple days ago and growing up I, I have to be honest i wasn't a huge fan of foreign films uh I, the only one i can really remember seeing in the 80s 90s was europa europa which really <laughs> have you seen it no <laughs> it's about a jewish child who's forced to pretend he's in like the the hitler youth to survive world war ii it's a semi-biopic it's it was traumatizing so i don't think it was i don't, if you knew what it was about you wouldn't have laughed but And it wasn't because I don't like the subtitles. My wife, Vanessa, she's Brazilian. She speaks three languages. So it's not because she doesn't understand English. It's sometimes the dialects or when it's in mixed in with action and sound effects. So our entire relationship of 15 years, we've watched movies and TVs with subtitles on. I have found it is a great benefit. You pick up on the little nuances, the subtleties, sound effects, the things that you would miss. But I got to tell you, I was really, really glad that Lisa commissioned this movie, and I was willing to step outside of my traditional comfort zone. Ash, you and I are closer in age. Uh, So when was the first time you saw City of Lost Children? So my freshman year of college, I became really obsessed with the movie Amelie. I, I really loved it, and I went on kind of this searching to find out everything else that these directors had done. And I found uh, Delicatessen first, which is a fantastic cannibalism film if you've never seen it before. Um, And I really grew up loving all things French. I've said I'm from New Orleans. Um, I grew up speaking French. um, And so this was just very much in my wheelhouse. Um, I remember loving the movie from my very first viewing. And it's one of those films that just sticks out iconically in my mind as something that I, as an adult, I didn't want to go back and rewatch because it meant so much to me at one point. And I was afraid that it wouldn't hold up. And so I was a little nervous when I, you know, hit the the play button. But I, I was very excited to revisit this and, you know, really excited to talk about it tonight. I, like you, was obsessed with New Orleans in particular and and French and, by extension, France uh, as, a, as a teenager. So I got into uh, Anne Rice books at a, at a pretty young age, and there was a lot of references to France and New Orleans. And so I decided, even though I grew up in Arizona, that it would be smart to study French instead of Spanish, uh, which has not really benefited me all that much. But the plan was kind of to to live your life, actually, Ash, was to graduate high school, go to Tulane, live in New Orleans the rest of my life. And I thought, well, surely I need to speak French to do that. It would have been amazing, but the the Air Force didn't want to pay for it. So Mm. Arizona State, it was. And and to our traditional Shat the Movies listeners, who at this point are probably like, ah, fuck this movie. I'm going to wait till next week. Give this shit a chance. This movie is fucking wild. I When I hit play, I was like, oh, God, what's this going to be? In the end, I was glad I watched it. So maybe hit pause on the podcast. Give it a chance. You can find it on on most on a bunch of streaming services. This shit is worth watching. Even if you don't like traditional foreign films, uh, give it a chance. Also, right now, during the coronavirus uh, lockdown, a lot of people have increased their drinking. 
But another thing that I don't think they're measuring nationally is how much weed people are smoking. So if you're smoking a lot of weed right now, this is a great movie to watch. And that takes me back to 1995. I didn't smoke weed in high school, but I had a lot of stoner friends. And I remember the first time I saw this movie is with my friends Forrest and Christy, and they were high as hell. And this room just had like spilt bong water and lava lamps and like Pearl Jam's Vitology was playing in the background. Like this takes me right back to being 15 years old. uh, And it was a fucking crazy night. So without further ado, Big D, roll the trailer. Kronk, a highly intelligent but malicious being, is unable to dream, which causes him to age prematurely. He shares a lair with other creations, six childish clones, a dwarf named Martha, and a brain in a vat named Irvin. Kronk uses a dream-extracting machine to steal dreams from children. The children are kidnapped for him by a cyborg cult called the Cyclops, whom he supplies with mechanical eyes and ears. Among the kidnapped is Don Rey, the adopted little brother of a carnival strongman named One, played by Ron Perlman. So I've already established that I like subtitles. I think they add to the experience of a film. But in this case, it was the complete opposite. The world that they build, it is so detailed that I found myself having to rewind multiple times because I was actually focusing on the dialogue and I was missing the little details all around. And this was the only time that I wished there was an English dubbing option because this world is so detailed. Oh, man, but a dubbing would have just ruined it because part of what makes this so great is the way the French is. And I I get it. I I get what you're saying about subtitles. I actually watch everything with subtitles. I only have about 23% hearing in my left ear. I'm clinically deaf. And so I have a lot of trouble hearing, especially if like the volume has to be down for for some reason. And so I usually watch with subtitles. But in this case, I turned it way up and the French came in handy um, because it was so nice to just kind of get to enjoy that visual eye candy that, you know, that the movie produces from the first shot. Yeah, and speaking of that dialogue, guys, although there are subtitles on the screen, thankfully there's not a lot going on in the in the way of talking, especially at the beginning. And Americans, when we think of foreign films, we tend to stereotype them, especially French films, as being a lot of random shots of things that don't make sense. I think of the kids of the hall actually when they do like foreign movie clips and it's always like it's they they do this right there's shots of things that don't make sense there's very little dialogue and like a hyper focus on close-ups of people with lots of sounds city lost children is guilty on all three counts the movie is doing this stuff constantly but when you learn to accept this movie on its own terms you realize that a lot of our objections to french film are the result of our own impatience and discomfort as Americans. Like, as Americans, we don't like close-ups of people's mouths. We don't like slobber on the lens. We don't like close-ups of people eating or the sound of people eating or biological sounds in general. And one thing we really hate is silence, when there's people on screen and nobody's saying anything. And those things that make our stomachs turn as Americans, that make us squirm a little bit, 
that's a shortcut to our emotional response. It's supposed to feel that way. It's supposed to make you uncomfortable. And I think a great example of that in this movie is that scene where the Cyclops are kidnapping Don Ray. There's this tension building and they're in their little trailer and they're searching around and that tension's building and you're just dying for someone to say something or do something. And the director's playing on that. They're stretching it out as far as they can. It's brilliant. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think when the movie opens up with that first image of Conk and that headset, and you know that this movie's just going to totally blow you away with what it's going to produce for you to to look at. You mentioned in the opening, you know, the costumes by Jean-Paul Gaultier, like those were absolutely beautiful to look at. And it kind of reminds me of movies like Brazil, uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey, Blade Runner. They're movies that are almost meant more to be seen and experienced than to be understood. I think we oftentimes as an American audience, we think that there has to be every moment has to be understood in a film. And in those types of movies, and this one included, the plot isn't there. The plot is the visuals. And there's something artistic and really enjoyable for me about that. So I'm a a bit of a tinkerer. I like to build things in the garage, whether they're electronic, mechanical, and I always find myself focusing on how did they make that set? How did they how did they build that? And these sets, the design is absolutely gorgeous. It is the most quality steampunk aesthetic that I've ever seen. They don't just throw up that copper color. Everything is riveted. Every gauge is real. That amazing chair with the headgear on it or the sarcophaguses for the children that open up and the entire mechanism is on this giant gear. The entire lab is beautiful. Irving, the uncle, the brain that's in the fish tank. And it has some kind of an old school, uh, you know, glass plate camera where the opening with the lenses extends out. And there's the phonograph speakers on the side. It is fucking wild, but it is so beautiful. You could just sit and look at these sets. And even if you don't have an appreciation for the story, just the craftsmanship that went into these, it's mind blowing. Yeah, I think one's sweater alone deserves its own shrine. It's it's a it's a piece of art. And it's funny because we think about like our American equivalent of what this would be, and it'd be like a Tim Burton movie. Tim yeah. Burton seems laughably amateur compared to this. This is 10 times more creative with this creepy yet fantastic eye candy. And I, I would compare this to like a movie that I love, Edward Scissorhands, and you've got this is a next level shit as far as the visuals go. Oh, absolutely. Uh, But I do think because I mean, I've kind of just been gushing and I wanted to try to be fair. There is one thing that's always confused me about this movie, and that's the casting of Ron Perlman. I mean, he is huge in this movie, Mm. but he is not French, nor does he speak French. Um, He only learned enough French to speak the very few lines that he that he had. Uh, He actually was the only American on set. And for me, he's always just kind of looked ridiculous. And his French sounds really ugly, too. Um, I would be curious to see what our French listeners think if they agree with me on that. But uh, he is something that his casting has always been very confused confusing for me see i think he fits he's a bit frankensteinish in his appearance uh yeah he's ripped he looks great i mean he's he doesn't fit in with the rest of the characters and i think that's what they were going for he is unlike anyone in the cast he's more simple there's a genuine nature to him and i thought he was great i gotta tell you i like david arbor as the new hellboy but ron perlman there is something about his physicality that I think was the main reason they cast. What's funny is I've seen this movie several times. I never assumed that one was French. Like I thought that he was like some American sailor who wound up in France. And that's why he speaks only broken French. Like I I really enjoyed him in this movie and his haircut is fucking bad. This is the best looking Ron Perlman. I think we've ever seen. He's got that like kind yet bestial face that made him perfect for the role as you said, Big D, he looks like, you know, the other. And in a world of things that terrify the shit out of children, he seems oddly comforting. And that brings me <laughs> to my question for you, Ash. Before we recorded this, we were talking about <laughs> you watching this movie with your son, Finn, who is what, four years old? He's four, yes. Four years old. This movie's got scary hags. It's got child thieves. It's got a fucking stabbing in the street. There's a giant beating a little girl and a guy getting a fucking knife pushed through his eye hole. Do you want your kid to have nightmares? 
So first of all, he's a he's a weird kid. I mean, he's a lot like me. When <laughs> I wonder I was a why. Kid. I wonder why um, he's a weird kid. Right. I, I saw Fright Night for the first time when I was four years old and began my journey into loving vampires. So I guess maybe I'm a bad parent. But um, I think, you know, like I had told you, I didn't let him watch it until after a certain point in the movie. And then I fast forwarded through one scene because I think a lot of it, the visuals he was just really enthralled by. He thought they were really interesting. And he's a kid who likes Nightmare Before Christmas. He likes, you know, aspects of Rocky Horror Picture Show that we've allowed him to see, not the full movie. You know, he loves Edward Scissorhands. You know, he he likes that kind of aesthetic. And so I think he just, he enjoyed it. But we didn't let him watch the whole thing. The whole thing we did not let him see yet. Well, one is hired by a criminal gang of orphans run by a pair of conjoined twins named the Octopus to help them steal a safe. The theft is successful, but the safe is lost in the harbor when one is distracted by seeing Don Ray's kidnappers. One and an orphan called Miet follow the Cyclops and are captured. Meanwhile, the octopus orders circus performer Marcelo to return one to them. Marcelo uses his trained fleas, which secrete a poison that causes mindless aggression, to turn the Cyclops guards against each other before rescuing one. However, He leaves Miette behind, who almost drowns before an amnesiac driver living beneath the harbor retrieves her. So at this point in the movie, these really beautiful themes start to emerge. You have this really wonderful interaction uh, in that main room between Kronk and Irvon. And basically, the brain, he lets Kronk know that he is the reason for the nightmares that these children keep having during the experiments because Kronk does not have a soul. And watching this as an adult, it was really interesting because so much of the plot becomes clear in that one moment for me. Because think about it, if these children in this film, they're representing this ability to imagine something beyond themselves, beyond the reality that they find themselves in, which children are able to do. And when you age, you begin to lose that ability, which means you kind of begin to lose the ability to hope and to hope for something beyond the circumstances that you find yourself in. So it's this really interesting question in the movie of when you lose your youth, do you lose your reason for being? And that's why the world is utter darkness when you sleep, because there's nothing there for you. And I think while that's tragic, I personally find really dark things beautiful. And I find that beautifully dark and tragic. And it just begs the question I had to ask, you know, do you guys dream? I literally woke up this morning and started messaging friends of mine to ask them if the coronavirus lockup has changed people's dreaming. Because I, pre-coronavirus pandemic, rarely dreamt. I think we've talked about it on the podcast before. Like, I just don't have dreams. Or if I do, I don't remember them. And I think part of it was that I was so stimulated by having an overactive social life and going to the gym every day and just wearing myself out and having all these interactions that my brain fed itself enough during the day. Now I spend like 16 hours a day or more staring at a screen, especially now that we're doing Twitch, everybody. And I get very little physical activity. And I think my brain is now trying to satisfy itself through very frequent and very vivid dreams. I woke up this morning, and started texting people and saying, Hey, you guys dreaming more? And everyone's like, no, it's, you're just weird. Yeah, if we have any professionals out there, I, I still have the same dreams. I'm losing <laughs> something. I'm lost. Uh, I, I'm searching my entire dream frantically for like Emma, for the keys, for my car. Uh, I'm at work and there's some project that came up that I just totally forgot about. So there's obviously something buried deep down in my psyche. It's I don't enjoy it. I want some help, please. I want to have normal dreams or no dreams at all. Please write in. Tell me what I can do. See, I prefer not to dream. Dreams, I, I don't like being trapped in this this dream state. It, it kind of freaks me out because when I do dream, I dream really uh, realistically. I don't dream in this fantastical way. And so a lot of times it'll be just kind of these boring, you know, banal replays of a day or like it's a normal, you know, interaction where like I'm back at work and nobody wants that while they sleep. But I'm kind of like you, Gene, I I don't typically dream often because I do keep myself very busy and I only sleep like five or six hours a night. I'm not a big sleeper. Uh, But now that I'm 
sleeping more, I guess, because I have more time on my hands. I am dreaming a lot more lately. And it's a lot of me just like pacing my house. And it's really creepy. <laughs> so it is not a fun thing. But I, I wonder, though, if this whole idea here, because we're so busy, like you're talking about, is that causing us to lose this imagination? Because you have to have silence in order to imagine. And if we don't consciously allow ourselves to imagine during the day, is that why our brains aren't imagining when we sleep? Or also, do you think it is as we as we grow, as we become adults, we lose that sense of wonder of what's possible? We've we've kind of gotten into our routines about what our life will be, our responsibilities. To kids, absolutely, the sky's the limit. When I ask Emma, I'm like, "Hey, did you have any dreams? You know, when you're sleeping in your head?" And she's like, "Oh yeah, there was banners all over the bedroom, and it turned into a birthday, and a unicorn came in the window." And I'm like, "Shit, I want those dreams." I would. That's so much better than adult dreams. I mean, the King Bee has got some shit it can sell you if you want to see unicorns coming in through your windows. We can help you out with that. But aside from dreams, another big theme in this movie is the music. And if you haven't listened to the soundtrack for City of Lost Children on its own, it is a masterpiece. It is absolutely beautiful. City of Lost Children has one of the most amazing scores I've ever heard. And since the first time I saw it, the theme to City of Lost Children has been stuck in my head. That's Marcello's song that he's playing to the train fleas. That song and Marcello himself are so tragic and so memorable and just so gorgeous as works of art in and of themselves. And if you pair that with the natural flow that the soundtrack does into Marianne Faithful's Who Will Take My Dreams Away, which is like the only song from this soundtrack with lyrics, this soundtrack fucking slaps. And if you're wondering why, it's because all the music from City of Lost Children was composed, as we mentioned before, by Angelo Badalamenti, who is an American. And if you're wondering, like, God, it sounds really familiar. What is this haunting score? This is the guy who works with David Lynch for most of his movie scores. So that's where that familiarity builds up. I believe also for Twin Peaks, too. Like, yep. I think he also did the music for that. And and I agree when, you know, when you're talking about Marcella's song that that plays, I mean, it's always kind of reminded me of this personified version of what like a tear would sound like if you could hear what a tear sounds like as it falls. And I don't mean like a boohoo tear. I mean, like a solitary, dramatic, very French tear that's like sliding down someone's cheek under a Parisian moon while you smoke a cigarette. Like, that's what it sounds like. And it's absolutely haunting. And it's beautiful and it's really intoxicating. And I absolutely love it. What I really appreciate is they've built this world that's just visually stunning. A lot of other movies, the little details just kind of fall to the wayside. Hey, we've built this beautiful world. Nobody's really paying attention to the little stuff. But this movie really does a great job of giving you little visual treats. And I'm just like, oh, shit, I can't believe they did that. You have the twin sisters who are cooking. And they're doing some kind of vegetables. And one of them kind of reacts like her arm itches. The other one scratches it. One of them is taking a drag off of a cigarette. The other one exhales the smoke. And again, I'm the one who hates like slapstick comedy. There's a scene where it very much is three stooges. The kids are like, they use a rope to trip the cop. And the cop falls over like the channel and his hands are tied. And he keeps blowing his whistle. But it's now muffled because he's like half in the water. These little details that the characters do, I thought was a nice addition to the movie. Yeah, they really do a lot with very little big D. I mean, you mentioned the the octopus, the sisters, right? As they're cooking. It's two women in a giant dress that has both a minute and they just have their arms crossed and they're just acting. They don't need crazy special effects to make it believable. And it's so unsettling. They are so fucking creepy. Also, when you don't know where one of their speech ends and the other one begins, just the way that they deliver the dialogue, that's all you need. Yeah, I mean, the set pieces too. I mean, we don't see a whole lot of this world, but the set pieces are enough to let us know that a greater world exists out there. We can imagine it on our own. I mean, they make use of every single scene. And they do so many bizarre, like you said, set pieces. They have some ingenious contraptions that they use throughout the movie that are also visually beautiful. When we see the sleeping guard outside the octopus's, uh, whatever their orphan lair is, (laughs) <laughs> and the, the you know the 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 sleeping guard has that French basket with like a baguette and some meats you know and he's having a little snack, and when the dog comes close, <laughs> the rope pulls the basket up. I'm like, yeah, I like that. That's cute. Or they want to retrieve the key from inside the door. They have this whole mouse little gambit with the mouse with a magnet tied to it, and they sprinkle cheese. I thought all this was really cute, and they used this 
to like later on in the movie, there's a giant Rube Goldberg machine that we see a series of events that turns the tide of the plot. And it took a lot of thought and I think a lot of bravery, but I appreciated it. Yeah, Big D, all the stuff you just mentioned is the reason why an American director should never remake City of Lost Children. Like, I'm trying to imagine how bad that Rube Goldberg machine would be or how bad the safe cracking scene would be. It'd be a bunch of smiling kids (laughs) and they'd be blurting out cool (laughs) catchphrases while they're doing stuff and a bunch of over the top pranks that they're playing on the guard who would probably be played by Kevin James or something like that. And, you know, come to think of it, they wouldn't even let the kids be thieves at all because that would set a bad example for American children. Instead, it'd be like some kids trying to rescue their dog from the bad guy or kiss Wendy Peppercorn or some bullshit. <laughs> I, I love that these kids are little hoodlums. Like, And when we mentioned you know, the, the, the American dubbing, no, it's great that they're in French because kids speaking French sound tough. They're like, oh, <laughs> yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the best of the little hooligans, obviously, is Miet. I mean, Miet is such a great character. I've always loved her. And we see in this portion of the film that she kind of becomes the central figure that I think a lot of people weren't expecting. You start the movie not believing she's going to be one of the main characters, and then and then she does, and she's really interesting. And this is really special for me because I actually call our our daughter Ellie, my nickname for her is Miet. That's what I call her. Um, it means crumb or kind of like sweet little morsel or sweet little bite. That what it, that's what it means when you translate it. Um, here, I know they're probably meaning for her name to be the insulting type of crumb, which I don't mean when I call my daughter Miet. But um, I think she's amazing. I think her outfits, her wardrobe are amazing. And her performance is, I mean, there's so many kid actors that could not have pulled off what she does in this movie. And we always complain about child actors. I don't know if it's because she's French, the foreign language. There is something about her and the other kid actors that that exude this this very mature nature that I found myself like, fuck, where are these kids in American movies? Where are these kids? Instead, we get that the fucking kid in like, uh, what was the jingle all the way? Little shit bags <laughs> like that. I want some of these kids. Some Bring in the heavy acting chops. Let's import them. At the risk of increasing my creep rating to 97, <laughs> I I know this is wholly inappropriate, but I, since I was a teenager, have always had this sort of non-sexual crush on Miette for all the reasons that Ash just mentioned. Like City of Lost Children did an amazing job, as you said, Big D, of showing the maturity and like emergence of these kids into young people. You know, it, I don't consider it a coming of age story, but it certainly highlights the qualities of this strong girl without being like Disney about it, right? It's not Disney's brave. She still retains that cynicism and those, those street smarts. And she's got style for miles, like those curls and the dress and the jacket. Like she looks badass. I just like that scowl. She's giving you the side eye all the time. Well, as Miette leaves the diver's lair to find one and Marcello both drowning their sorrows in a bar. The octopus confronts them on a pier and uses Marcello's stolen fleas to turn one against Miette. A spectacular chain of events triggered by one of Miette's tears leads to a ship crashing onto the pier before one can throttle her. Marcello arrives and sets the fleas on the octopus, allowing one and Miette to escape to continue searching for Don Rey. I mean, at this point, what I love about this is that this movie feels so much like a stream of consciousness from a child's imagination. They capture that really beautifully. Like, you know, if you asked my son to create a movie, he'd be like, yeah, there's this circus guy and and, and his, and his name is One. And, hold and, hold and then on. There's- if, you're, if your child is coming up with this story, I think we need to go see a doctor. You know what I mean? Because it's weird. It's this amalgam yes. of things. Like, oh, well, and then there's a diver, but but he can't remember anything. And and then there's a bar with a really pretty lady, but then he gets he gets sleepy and falls because he wouldn't know he was drunk. And he gets sleepy and falls asleep. And you know, and, and it would be this whole thing. And and what I love about that is that it gives it this childlike innocence, but still remains creepy. It reminds me of like the movie Pan's Labyrinth. I think a movie like that was highly influenced by this film. And while Pan's Labyrinth is much darker than this movie is because it deals with the adult side as well, I think what this captures is that the greatest fear that children have that they don't know they have is becoming adults. And you don't realize that the greatest fear has come true until it's too late. It's why one of my favorite books is Where the Wild Things Are. It's 12 sentences about how much it fucking sucks to grow up because the land of the wild things is fucking scary. 
scary and there's big teeth and they gnash them and there's yellow eyes and you just want to go home and have a bowl of fucking hot dinner waiting for you. And that's what this movie captures is that it's these children that have these imagination that don't want to become these adults. That's what they're afraid of. And this movie captures that in a really great way of this nightmare that awaits us, but that sense of foreboding, the kids don't understand why it's there to begin with. Yeah, I think there is something to it. I think you're right. There's a whimsical nature that doesn't make logical sense. So when we go to the diver's lair, it's this underground uh, compound that he has. And the attention to detail where he is documenting the history of everything that's been thrown away. And you see all the objects laid out. They're aged, they're rusted, they're labeled. I just found myself thinking, this is a twisted nightmare version of Ariel's collection of who's that's and what's it's a plenty, like her underground, <laughs> you know, where she's grave robbing from these shipwrecks. Her dingle This hoppers. is what it would be like in a twisted, dark, real world theme. And, and everything is so detailed. So much like I imagine Ashley has, I've taken a lot of writing courses. And one of the writing courses I took was actually for comic books. Uh, so the King B and I are big comic book and graphic novel fans. And we thought, wouldn't it be great to create a book ourselves? This is back when we were teenagers. And speaking of dreams dying, it, it never really happened. Instead, you got a, <laughs> a podcast about movies. But uh, in doing so, I was always taught with comic books is that you have visual things in the background and panels that you never quite explain. And you let the reader's mind take over as to what that thing is, right? Say, uh, say you know, Batman has the Batmobile. You have a couple of gadgets and stuff on the side of it that he never uses, but you let the reader wonder what those things do and make up their own stories as to what that world is all about. And like you said, with this diver's layer, Big D, that's, that's a great example of all these visual things that you tell yourself the story of what the city is all about from the artifact. And I love that they don't waste time explaining those unessentials. You don't get a cutaway about what this thing was or exposition about it. Like, I don't know how Miet got into the diver's lair. She fell in the exactly. water and then she was there. You know, the diver got her and they apparently has a door or something. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I think it's interesting you bring up Little Mermaid because the French version of the Little Mermaid ends with her dissolving into foam. Um, so it does not end in a happy way. So this is very much a French children's story that's scary. It's kind of creepy and it's alluring because of that. So at this point in the movie, I could not believe I found myself actually really getting invested in the characters. I was getting really upset when the octopus start winding up the organ and they're playing the music and one starts to slap the shit out of me yet. I actually found myself upset. I was like, no, no, I, I'm like, I can't believe in this, this whimsical fairy tale world. I'm caring about this character. You know, I actually was invested. And I totally thought as the camera pans up and we see the front of the ship after that Rube Goldberg machine led it to hitting the dock. I'm like, oh, fuck, they're going to drop the anchor and kill the octopus. I'm like, oh, my God, don't do it. Don't do it. And they subvert my expectations. When I think the sisters are going to get the anchor on them, instead, they start torturing one and Minette down there, dumping fuel into the water. They're going to roast them. And what I hate about a lot of movies is the bad guys, they usually meet a grisly end. But nobody ever gets truly what they deserve. And this movie does it multiple times. So the octopus, when I think they're going to get an easy way out with the anchor, instead, they're turned on each other and actually have to kill each other and end up burning alive in this lake of fire. I was like, yes. Or the end, when we get the creator who we believed is the hero, and we actually start to think about it. He's not the good guy in the story. He gets what he deserves. It was such a pleasant surprise to see people get what they had given. As we speak about villains, I do want to take a moment and talk about Daniel Emelfork. So he, I believe, is the Chilean actor, and he played Kronk. And sadly, he passed away in 2006. But I just want to take a moment to send a shout out to that guy in his memory. Because let's be honest, this movie does not exist without him. He is dynamite every second he's on screen and he doesn't hold back at all the guy has no boundaries when it comes to facial expression he has no boundary when it comes to physical expression uh, and he's just so versatile and i know we use that term a lot but this guy really is i mean think about the way he emotes when he's broken in his failures when he feels like he cannot succeed uh when he is suffering to when he's being enraged and just taking it out on everybody around him and my favorite scene in the whole movie is when they're trying to get the eyedropper to get the one tear off his <laughs> eye and he just going keeps going eh, 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 eh. and 
another shout out to his Ruguru impersonation when he does the little werewolf. I, I jumped mm-hmm. in my seat and I was like, he said Ruguru. Mm-hmm. So I just I just love him and I can't get enough of him. I wanted another 20 minutes just with him on screen. Mm-hmm. Well, back at Crank's oil rig, Irvin gets one of the clones to release a plea for help in the form of a bottled dream telling the story of how they were created. It reaches one, Miet. And the diver remembers that he was the scientist who made them and that the oil rig was his laboratory before Conk and Martha pushed him off to take it for themselves. They all converge on the rig, the diver to destroy it, and the duo to rescue Don Ray. So this is a famous thing that I'm about to talk about that I'm not the first person to bring this up from this movie, but there's a lot of people who get kind of a stranger danger vibe from one and in that scene with he and Miet when they're sleeping on the the rubble when he's blowing on her back and pretending like he's a radiator. And then later when he's, you know, rubbing her feet, uh, a lot of people think that it's a little off, that he's a little too flirty. Um, I, I get that. Uh, I do think that we, you know, that isn't what's happening. I don't think that's being implied, but I think it's at least worth mentioning because that's something a lot of people talk about with this movie, like how you had the crush gene. They think that, you know, he had a little more than a crush perhaps on, on me at Okay, so Gene always thinks that I see child abuse and, and and inappropriate adult child contact and everything, whether it's Toy Story. This one, I do not get that vibe at all. I don't get a very sexual vibe from one. Even when he's with the prostitute and she's right in his face, I don't get that vibe. I think he's just compassionate and caring. The radiator is actually to show her just some physical touch that's caring. Now, Minette, You could see when she's like, well, will you take a wife? What are you looking for? She's thinking about him in that way. But I don't get a weird, creepy vibe from one at all. Well, if we go back to his response, though, she says, will you take a wife and what will she be like? And he says, well, I need time to find shoes one's size, which I took as the undertone, meaning I'm waiting for you to grow up. But he said, what's the rush? Yeah, exactly. But I do think that he has an affinity for her. He just understands that she's she's a child. Now, I should say that I don't know if you guys experienced this, but I certainly did as a kid. I don't believe that me falling in love started when I even understood what love was or when I was an adult. When I was a child, there were family friends, women who were fully grown and I was a boy. And I think I, I think I loved them. Like, I think I was in love with them. And it doesn't mean that it would be an appropriate relationship, but they did show me affection and I did appreciate it. And there was nothing sexual about it. And I think, again, this is a cultural difference in the sense mm-hmm. that I, w- I didn't find it as threatening, like you said, Big D, but I do think that there is, it's more than just uh, buddies, right? There is, there is a love there. But he also does express to her that like, she is like his, you know, his little sister. And um, I think it's just, it's as close as two people can get when their age is that different. Uh, and yet they still have feelings for each other. Yeah. But these kids, man, can you imagine being the parents of these kids on set? You know, because in the US, I, I know at least that the parents of children that are under a certain age, you have to be on the set. They can only work certain hours. They have to have a tutor. But you imagine being on the, this crazy ass oil rig set and they got your kids strapped down in the sarcophagus. And okay, in this scene, you're going to be chewing on the red candle, okay? In the US, these laws, there would have been some kind of problem, but I guess they're a little more uh, laissez faire, you know, in the Europe. Do what you want with the children, throw them in the water. I feel like your French accent comes from the Little Mermaid with les poissons, les poissons, oh, <laughs> like that guy. Oui. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think that happens here, too. I mean, look at what happened with Linda Blair with The Exorcist. I mean, you know, her mother let her, you know, pretend to masturbate with the crucifix. And she was, you know, destroyed her destroyed her back. And that one scene where she's being flipped up and down, I mean, she has permanent damage from that. So I think it happens here as well. If you appreciated these scenes of children being like terrified and abused, uh, go check out the MGMT video for the song Kids. If you haven't seen it, this music video pissed off a lot of people because it features this toddler who's being menaced by monsters who are like jumping around outside of his crib. And then as he goes through the city uh, with his mom, there's like mutilated people following him around and stuff. And they released a behind the scenes thing where they show that this kid was actually having a blast. He was laughing. They were playing with him and stuff. And then they edited the video to make it look terrible. It's studio magic, folks. Don't worry about the kids. And there's a great 
payoff with all this. I mean, I think about great moments in cinema, these amazing images that need no context to be appreciated. And I think about like Tony Montana with the machine gun or uh, Alex in a clockwork orange or Jack and the shining coming through the door or Olivia Newton, John and Xanadu. I think that Kronk dressed as Santa Claus deserves to be on that list. It, I was laughing so hard and I felt mm-hmm. so guilty. He is inches from these children's faces and he's getting angrier and just yelling at them. This is exactly my kind of comedy. But like you said, The Shining, the child actor in that did not know it was a horror movie. They kept him away from all those scenes. How do you explain these kids screaming, terrified as this demented bad Santa is in their face? Well, I i mean, I'm no parent, but don't kids just do that on their own anyway? No. Yes. No. It's probably because <laughs> well, their mo- does. It's because their mother's letting them watch The City of Lost Children at four years old. That's why they scream in terror at Santa. Oh, my God. Well, well, I mean, my child doesn't like anything in a costume. like So, like, Mickey Mouse or, like, Elmo. Roger Roper. Roger Roper or dressed up as George Washington. I mean, anything like that. I mean, I think that he understands the uh, the lie that's there. And there's something about that that's markedly terrifying to him. I mean, he he's not there for it at all. And and Gene, you've recommended this movie, you know, maybe if you want to smoke a little, you know, while you're in your Corona social distancing, I say, fuck no, no way. I did my fair (laughs) share of mushrooms and LSD in college. And I'm telling you right now, don't do it. Don't, this is like an adult version of where the wild things are. It is a twisted mushrooms, LSD hallucination of some child's book. I felt like this is the worst part. I never had a bad trip, luckily. But as this movie was going on, as like they're, they're we're seeing the christmas scene and the walls are like breathing and melting and i was like <sighs> <sighs> i was like is there a possibility there's still some of this in my system is this coming out now if i was high i would have had a panic attack so be warned people don't do drugs and watch this at least don't do it without somebody there to to chaperone and and guide you along your trip and definitely don't watch it with your porn goggles on because <laughs> Not great. No. No. Well, the diver harpoons Martha. Miette finds a boy she mistakes for Danre asleep in Conk's dream extracting machine. And Irvin tells her that to release him, she must enter the machine herself. In the dream world, she meets Conk and makes a deal with him to replace the boy as the source of the dream. Conk fears a trap, but he plays along. Miette then uses her imagination to control the dream and turn it into an infinite loop destroying Kronk's mind. One and Miette rescue all the children and find Danre feasting in another room while the now deranged diver loads the rig with dynamite and straps himself to one of its legs. A seabird lands on the handle of the blasting machine, blowing him up and the rig. I, I think that this movie, we've talked a lot about the visuals and about, you know, the the scary, creepy parts, but it's got some cute comedy in it as well. You mentioned the part with like the Santa Claus and, and all of that, but I think that the laughs are earned at the end. They're kind of silly with the brothers not untying the boat, but it worked for me. You know, the bird, you know, landing on the the thing that pushes the dynamite down the trigger. I thought that was all really cute. And, you know, and the kid, Don Hui, you know, all throughout the film, him he just eating sausage and eating food. I mean, that's totally my mood for this quarantine. So like, I really related to that. And I thought it was really funny. And I think that's something that we haven't mentioned yet is that there's some funny parts of this film, just like a kid's movie should have. It was kind of very home alone Some of those kind of slapsticky things that they do in the movie that work really well amidst this fantasy. Uh, so, Gene, were you okay with the uh, little person with the oversized revolver? <laughs> were you okay with that gambit? Uh, I was oh, I was shocked, actually, when I forgot about the fact that the diver shows up and just casually harpoons her through the gut. Like, I was just like, what the fuck? And then she's, like, coughing up blood. I'm like, okay, kids, anyway, you know, Finn, this is how we treat little people, I guess. But but I want I, I want to logic. I through that part. I fast forwarded. Yeah. I want to I want to focus on another person in this movie that really bothered me at first and that was Dominique Pignon. So this guy, I don't know if you guys agree. And listen, Dominique, if you're listening, this is nothing personal. I think it's the way that the movie was shot, honestly, but you have a horribly annoying face. And Ash, you may recognize him from that sex scene in Amelie. It's it's disturbing when it's having sex in particular. 
Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. in this movie, we get seven of it. So this like really bothered me with the clones. And then I realized, at least with the diver, he had a beard to cover some of it up. So it wasn't that disturbing. But did this guy's face bother you guys? Uh, no, I mean, sure. I mean, I think he's got a really comedic face for for this kind of a, a thing, for this kind of shtick. I mean, he, he's he got those great facial expressions, especially in that scene where they're trading out, giving the, the play-by-play of the dream and all the different uh, brothers are trading out. I think it works there, but... I had forgotten that he was that person and Amelie until you just said that. And so, yes, now he absolutely disturbs me. And I'm glad that I did not uh, did not think about that ahead of time. No, he, he does look like a child. He's got that face. It looks like it's like Play-Doh. Like mm. it's uh, you remember Men in Black when the farmer is taken over by that alien who's Sugar wearing water. him as like as like a meat suit. That's yeah. what I felt like this guy was. I could believe he was a mindless clone who was like, oh, I feel special. I'm the original. I believed it. If you had a good looking actor or someone who just looked like a normal human being, you wouldn't have been able to pull that off. I'm, I'm so sorry, Dominique. We love you. <laughs> uh-huh. Anyway, that brings us to the point in the podcast where we bring up our chat scores for The City of Lost Children. Again, the chat meter uh, is a zero to five score, five wipes being the worst movie. Uh, It is a harpoon through the gut as you uh, spew brain matter from explosions all over your laboratory. And a zero wipes is a crystal clear escape uh, from the harbor as the diver pulls you in and puts you into the world's greatest sweater. Big D, we'll start with you. What is your wipe score for The City of Lost Children? I'm going to say I'm going to give it a 1.5 wipe. I think it's much better than average. It was much better than I expected. The visuals, they're stunning. It's imaginative. It's well put together. It's well crafted. The set design is stunning. And I found myself surprisingly caring about these characters that were ridiculous. And I was simultaneously just in awe of this world that they had built, something like I had never seen before. And it just made me so sad to realize that Tim Burton's a hack. Tim Burton mm-hmm. is, it's a joke. I want to see this guy. Uh, the direct, what's the director's name again? Well, there are two of them, but the primary one is uh, Jean-Pierre Jeunet. Yes, please do Edward Scissorhands. Please do The Princess Bride. Please do Dune. I want to see what you can do with really, really like a strong craftsman behind it. It would be so much better because Edward Scissorhands looks like a Hallmark card version. This dude is twisted, perverted. It's just, oh, so much better. So I think one and a half is fair. I was leaning a little lower, but it's a bit long, and some of the story is a bit convoluted. But overall, a great surprise. Great surprise. I want to remind you, Big D, that my one and only Twitter rant ever was after your episode of Edward Scissorhands because I was very upset with some of the things that were said on that episode. So we're going to let that lie right now. (laughs) Um, And as for my uh, score, I I love this movie. I I don't think that that's been any surprise based off of what I've said throughout this episode. Um, I know it's bizarre. I know the plot, you know, it doesn't really have a written roadmap for people to follow, but that's what I love about it. It's total eye candy meant to be experienced in real time. Time, rather than us try to make sense of it along the way. I think it's beautiful. Um, it made me feel like I was a child again, imagining my worst nightmares come to life. And then those nightmares being satisfied in like the absolute best way. It's dreamlike. It's perfect um, in a lot of ways. Not quite as perfect as I would like it to be, but I would give it, you know, one wipe. I would say it's, you know, the say absolument ma belle fantaisie. Je l'adore. I'm with you, Ash, on the one wipe score. I think this movie is stylish, it's tragic, it's hilarious, and it's just so different from what we're used to seeing, especially on Shat the Movies. My only criticism about this, and I can't, it's an ineffable thing that I can't put my finger on, is I felt like I could walk away at any time. Like the the movie lacked a stickiness, and I don't know why. Uh, I just felt like I was enjoying myself. But if somebody's like, hey, you want to go to the store? I'd be like, all right, cool. Let's go. Like, you know, where there are other movies where I'm like, no, I'm fucking watching this right now. You know, piss off. So I don't know what that is. Uh, maybe it was just the pacing of it, the tone of it. And and that's not a complaint about the pacing, which was go, go, go. Like there was no downtime, I think, in this movie. Just something about it. Maybe it was how silent it was and the fact that I'm a big, dumb American. I don't know. Also, a little too much Dominique Pignon and that explosion at the end they could have just probably left off screen because it looked terrible awful Mm. what happened this is the same movie that has that great green smoke they ran out of money they had to have (laughs) run out of money they had to have 
<laughs> it was just uh, a little to- poof. <laughs> anyway, the one wipe, the one wipe, and the 1.5 wipe averaged out for City of Lost Children comes out to 1.16 repeating wipes. And Big D, where does that put it on the pantheon of Shat? Uh, that now puts it in the 29 spot. It is uh, slightly better than Coming to America, Raising Arizona. Ugh, and Braveheart, it is slightly worse than Seven, The Terminator, and Toy Story. So it is up there surprisingly. And I think when people see that, they're going to be like, oh, what is this? Give it a chance. It It's why you go to movies. It's to be entertained. Not everything has to be that same, uh, you know, typical story. This one is so different, but you can't deny the quality and the craftsmanship that it took to make this. I just can't believe that this is rated anywhere near a movie that features Randy Newman in the soundtrack. That is that is a crime. Gene, can you do a Randy Newman song for this movie? How about I do the shout outs as Randy Newman? <laughs> oh, Jesus. So uh, the shout outs, if you have never listened to this podcast before, is our way of saying thank you for going to shatthemovies.com and checking out our website where you can support the podcast at shatthemovies.com slash support. You can shop our store at shatthemovies.com slash shop. You can also now find our Twitch stream at shatthemovies.com slash Twitch, where we're doing a lot of live content uh, featuring our faces. We have been unmasked. Uh, and you also can go to shatthemovies.com slash shout out to get your name read on the podcast. And our shout outs this week go to Karen Duffy is hot as fuck and dumb and dumber. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You, you could the- say, and that email address is you could say my dick went big D at gmail.com. No, no more stuff. <laughs> All right. Great, because the next one really needs to be done in, in my most serious voice, and it is, read my poetry, dick hang like the noose on a tree, I love your mom's poo-tang, that pussy, I love to bang, me and the gang, gang bang. Wow. And finally, Big D, prove you live up to the name Big D, or you have a small D, and that comes from... <laughs> My ball sack is black at yahoo.com. I'm still waiting on those dick pics. I got to see what I'm going against right here. I'm not going into this blind. I got to know who I'm fighting. As Raj would say, hog out or log out. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for your shout outs. Again, if you want to hear your name on the podcast, just go to shatthemovies.com slash shout outs and give us your name. Some real names are accepted, too. If you just want to tell us like your name and where you're from, that would be fine. Instead of talking about balls. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Big D, what is the next movie we have coming up? Oh, next week, it's a very similar film to the one that we did this week. Uh, <laughs> it is very high brows. There's a lot of, uh, you know, themes that are very internal and the, the evaluation of oneself and dreams and what it means. Except this one takes place in the desert and involves large earthworms and just fucking just mayhem. So the story involves repairman Val McKee and Earl Bassett are tired of their dull lives in the small desert town of Perfection, Nevada. But just as the two try to skip town, they happen upon a series of mysterious deaths and a concerned seismologist studying unnatural readings below the ground. With the help of an eccentric couple, the group fights for the survival against worm-like monsters hungry for human flesh. It was commissioned by Mac Edwards. It was directed by Ron Underwood. The budget was $11 million, and it made almost 17 so this was a profitable movie it's very loved and i think more of our audience will have seen this movie since the city of lost children so stick around until after the podcast to hear the trailer for that movie if you haven't figured it out already i also want to send a big thank you to lisa for commissioning the city of lost children we had a great time watching it and i'm really glad we got to do it with big d i was i was nervous uh, I thought that uh, you wouldn't accept it uh, with your with your America fuck yeah ways. So oh, yeah. I'm really glad that, that you appreciated <laughs> it the way uh, Ash and I did. And I think we gave it a pretty fair score. Uh, if you'd like to support the podcast, once again, uh, you can shop our Amazon affiliate link, complete a free anonymous survey, buy our merch or commission your own movie. Find all that information by visiting our website, shatthemovies.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at Shat the Movies. And we are now on Twitch as well, as I mentioned before, where you can see some of our live content. If you play uh, Xbox, you can jump on with me and Raj as well. You can find all that at shatthemovies.com slash Twitch. Uh, Ash, I think, will be joining us for Battlefield 5, so that should be amazing. 
Uh, also, you can check out our sister podcast, Shadow TV, where we review TV series such as Taboo, American Gods, True Detective, Game of Thrones, and Watchmen. We also currently are doing Westworld. You can check all that out at ShatOnTV.com. Where everywhere fine podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe. And if you stop by iTunes, please leave a review. That helps the podcast grow. And if you'd like to check out uh, Ashley Schlafly's other work, she has her own podcast with her husband, Tom, and that's at the No Need to Argue podcast. You can find them on Twitter at No Need Pod. On behalf of my co hosts, Big D, Dick Ebert, and Ashley Schlafly, I'm Gene Lyons. Be sure to join us on the next podcast for the following movie. Be safe out there and stay the fuck at home. Welcome to Perfection, Nevada, land of opportunity. You know how close I am to leaving this place right now? How close? Where a man can make Ah, ah! a clean living. See, we plan ahead. That way we don't do anything right now. Earl, explain it to me. Hey, Bendy, what's the count? 640. In Perfection, they say there's nothing new under the sun. But under the ground. These creatures are absolutely unprecedented. But where do they come from? I vote for outer space. No way these are local boys. How could they bury a whole station wagon? Now, this valley is just one long smorgasbord. Ah, we can make it! Ah, ah, come on, we can go do. That's how they get you. They're under the ground. Oh, no! What? Damn prairie dog burl. We arm ourselves. We set perimeters. We stand guard. Hey! Kevin Bacon. We could get in People magazine. Fred Ward. People. Hell. National Geographic. Tremors. We decided to leave this place just one damn day too late.